Hello Internet! It's time to check the rest of our Pentax Electro Spotmatic. So far we checked the power supply and the input side of the circuit. That starts with the photoresistors, goes to the log compression and the JFET buffer. Now we will concern ourselves with the output side of the circuit that actually controls the operation of the shutter. The final output element of the circuit is the solenoid. It is the actuator that controls the movement of the second shutter curtain. The solenoid can block the movement of the second shutter curtain that tries to close the shutter and end the aperture. As long as the solenoid is energized, the second curtain cannot move into the frame in order to close the shutter. How can we test the solenoid? Well, the simplest check is just to look at its DC resistance. I have connected an ohm meter between pins 10 and 11. So it's directly across the solenoid and we see a resistance of about 340 ohm. That sounds very reasonable. And it's a good sign that our solenoid is okay. However, what we really want to know is whether the solenoid has enough force to actually stop the shutter curtain. So let's check that. Right now the camera is completely unpowered. It is not connected to its PCB. There is only the breakout harness that does nothing currently. And if I release the shutter, we hear that the camera makes a very short shutter time because when the electronics are not powered, the second curtain just can move through and the camera creates a exposure time of a thousandth of a, of a second. In order to test the action of the solenoid, we need to energize it. I have my bench power supply here because that is safer for this test than using the battery. And I have set it to 5.5 volts voltage and I have limited the current to a safe 50 milliamps. I connect the bench power supply now to ground, that is pin 12, and the positive side to pin 2. And that alone should change nothing. The camera still makes a one thousandth of a second exposure. But now I take a jumper lead and I will short pin 11 to ground, that is to pin 12. I connect pins 11 and 12. If you are very careful, you could do that directly on the connector without any breakout harness. Just be very careful not to short anything that you don't want to short. That's also a reason why it's safer to use a current limited power supply for this test. And now if I release, we see that the mirror is locked up and the second curtain is blocked by the solenoid. Only when I remove the short here can the second curtain enter the frame and the and the exposure and the shutter, sorry, and the mirror can come down. Let me show it once again. So this is without shorting pins 11 and 12. And this is with pins 11 and 12 shorted. Mirror stays up and once we remove the short, the shutter closes. Perfect. So now we know that the solenoid is perfectly fine and it is strong enough to stop the second shutter curtain. If we take a step back, the next output element to check would be the switching transistor on the PCB that activates the solenoid. And we could test it in isolation, but this would require some probing on the PCB because the signals we need are not directly accessible on the connector. So instead of doing that, we will take a few steps back and uh, test the switching transistor indirectly, including also the comparator that goes before it and the JFET buffer. I have connected the 
PCB to the test harness again. So the camera circuit is complete. It is still powered by the bench su power supply at 5.5 volts and limited to 50 milliamps. I now take my jumper lead and this time I short pin 3 to ground. This simulates an extremely low light situation. I will use a stopwatch to time the shutter action. And what we see is that the mirror stays up, the shutter stays open. As long as the short here exists, the pin 3 voltage cannot be moved upwards by discharging the timing capacitor. So as long as this short is there, the camera should never close the shutter as long as the electronics are powered. So we are now at over a minute of exposure time and nothing is happening. Now I will stop the watch and I will start it again when I remove the short. So now the short is removed. In this state, pin 3 should be able to move up in voltage by the discharge curve of the timing capacitor. However, it will take a long time because by having our short between pin 3 and ground before, we fixed the upper end of the storage capacitor at 0 volts, so it the capacitor was charged up to a negative voltage and it will therefore take a very long time for the discharge of the timing capacitor to move pin 3 up high enough to trigger the comparator. So let's wait a bit. Wow! Exactly at one minute. Um, so that's a very good sign that everything in the output section of the circuit is working. It indicates that the comparator is working, that the switching transistor is able to switch the current in the solenoid, and um, it also indicates that there is some discharging action happening that creates this very long time of one minute that we just witnessed. Now let's look at the other extreme of simulating extremely bright conditions. That's a bit more difficult. The most obvious thing to do would be to short pin 3 to the supply rail. But first problem with this is that then we would have only the Sina diode and a small series resistance between the supply and ground. And this could even damage the Sina diode if it weren't for our current limit in the power supply. So we definitely should use a resistor instead of a direct short. But there's another problem with pulling pin 3 up. And that is, as soon as the mirror swings up, the, if we pull pin 3 up, the only path to ground for the current is through the gate source junction of the buffer JFET and that means we will forward bias the gate source junction which is not the intended mode of operation for the JFET buffer and also doing this we can actually pull the JFET source output so high that the comparator is no longer able to pull down the base of the switching transistor enough to end the exposure. So what we will do instead is we will use a resistor to pull pin 9 up to the supply rail because when the mirror swings upwards pin 9 is disconnected from the rest of the circuit and therefore the pull-up cannot have any negative effect on the operation of the circuit from that point on. So I have here a 100 ohm resistor. I connect one end to pin 7, that is the VREC supply rail, and I connect the other end to pin 9. That should have the same effect 
has a very low resistance of the photoresistors due to very bright conditions. Let's release the shutter. And we see indeed that we get a very short shutter time. That's a good sign. To conclude these tests, let's also try to simulate a medium light level that causes a somewhat longer exposure. I have here a 100k ohm resistor that is connected between the supply rail at pin 7 and pin 9. I also have the voltmeter on pin 9 to ground and we see we get about 3.3 .3 volt at pin 9, a nice intermediate value. And let's check what the shutter time is. Yeah, some, something like three seconds or so. This is a very good sign because it indicates that all the, the discharge network and the comparator and the switching transistor, everything is working fine. Two important notes about these kinds of tests where you force a voltage on pin 9. The first is to not connect a multimeter or an oscilloscope to probe pin 3. Pin 3 is extremely sensitive. It is a very, very high impedance node. When a mirror is up, pin 3 is connected only to the extremely high input impedance in the giga ohms range of the JFET buffer. And even 10 mega ohms of a multimeter or oscilloscope probe and even hundreds of mega ohms input resistance of an op amp like the one I have here on my test board are enough to disturb the operation of the circuit. So unfortunately we cannot probe pin 3 directly. We will later use indirect methods to observe the discharge curve. The second remark is that if these tests with forcing a voltage at pin 9 do not work for you, it does not necessarily indicate that the comparator or switching transistor and so on are broken. Because between pin 9 and pin 3 you also have the voltage div dividers, the resistive dividers, that are operated by the aperture potentiometer and by the Acer film speed setting potentiometer. These resistive dividers can be trimmed in quite a wide range using these trimming potentiometers here. And if this trimming is very far off, this can also lead to these tests not working. That's the advantage of forcing pin 3 as we did when we connected pin 3 to ground because that excludes any influence of the resistive dividers. We will soon make more detailed tests that look at the JFET buffer in isolation and also at the discharge network more closely and these tests can tell you more about what is going wrong if the pin 9 tests don't work for you. We will later also look at the resistive dividers in isolation. The most important value we need to establish in order to proceed with our repair is how much the voltage at pin 9 or at pin 3 has to increase in order to halve the exposure time. We could measure that directly by forcing a voltage on pin 9 and timing the shutter curtains. And we will do such an integrated measurement later. But first I want to proceed in steps and show you how the individual parts of the circuit work. This will not be a minimal set of checks or measurements that you need to do to find out what is wrong with your camera. My goal here is to give you as much as possible information about how the circuit is supposed to work. You can then take this information and design a more streamlined series of measurements to diagnose problems with the camera. The setup I have right here is for characterizing the JFET buffer and we will need to know its characteristics later when we want to observe the discharge curve of the camera. I have only the PCB here, it's not connected to the camera body, only to the breakout harness. It is powered by a bench power supply with 5.5 volts.
and the current limit at 50 milliamps. I have a function generator here that generates a voltage ramp that is forced on pin 3 and also observed by the scope as channel 1, the yellow line. The output of the Chaffet buffer, the voltage at the Chaffet source, is tapped here and observed by the scope on channel 2, the cyan line. I have trimmed the threshold voltage as high as possible for us to get a maximum usable range of the Chaffet buffer. I have the multimeter here to monitor the VREG voltage supply and I have trimmed it to about 5.5 volts, which is most likely the voltage we will going to use at VREG. The measurements of the Chaffet buffer confirm exactly what we saw in our simulations, but they also give us some new information. We see that the gain in the approximately linear operating region is about 0.82 and I also measured the behavior of the Chaffet buffer at different threshold settings and at different trimmings of VREG. The good news is that the behavior in the important region below the threshold is almost independent from the threshold setting and the trimming of the supply voltage. Here we see some more complete results including the cutoff region the region of negative gate voltage and the region in which the gate source diode is becoming forward biased. This graph should give us an idea how the Chaffet buffer should work in a correctly trimmed circuit. The gate voltage is equal to the pin 3 voltage in the normal operating range of the Chaffet. Directly below the comparator threshold we find the pin 3 voltage for a time of one thousandth of a second. The meter of the Pentax Electrospotmatic indicates times between one second and a thousandth of a second. Let's say the pin 3 voltage for one second would be here. As the output of the Chaffet buffer, we then get the corresponding range of voltages that cause the meter to indicate exposures between one thousandth of a second and one second. For the actual exposure timing a somewhat larger range is significant that goes down to about 8 seconds of exposure time. The nonlinearities of the Chaffet buffer that get stronger in the lower range do not affect the metering at all. Nonlinearities in this upper range will affect the exposure time indicated on the meter but they will not affect the accuracy of the actual exposure time because that depends only on reaching the threshold voltage but these nonlinearities do not affect the threshold voltage. The threshold voltage is always at a fixed voltage at pin 3 that is slightly above the voltage corresponding to a thousandth of a second and the exposure time is only affected by the time it takes the discharge network to move up the pin 3 voltage to the threshold and not by the exact curve of the voltage throughout this time. So far I have always talked about the Chaffet buffer and there is only one on the board revision we are currently working on. But there are actually revisions of the Pentax Electrospotmatic board that have two Chaffet buffers. A separate one for the metering and one going to the comparator and the switch. Most of what we have discussed about the Chaffet buffer applies to all of these instances. They just have somewhat different working resistors and therefore a different operating range. One of the buffers in the older board revision has some temperature compensation network with an NTC connected to it. Due to its non-zero output impedance, the behavior of the Chaffet buffer is influenced by the comparator connected to its output. And there are also different revisions of the comparator. The board we are currently working on has a comparator built from two NPN transistors. One branch of the comparator has the NPN transistor paired with a PNP transistor, forming a regenerative pair of transistors. As soon as the comparator flips, this pair of transistors forms a positive feedback loop, causing the comparator to swing 
very quickly and decisively in order to turn off the switching transistor. However, this version of the comparator has the weakness that we already discussed, that if the buffered JFET source voltage is pulled too high, the comparator can no longer pull down its output enough to turn off the switching transistor. This can paradoxically make the camera keep its shutter open for a very long time when pin 3 indicates extremely high light levels. The older version of the comparator is just a single silicon controlled rectifier. This SCR is triggered once the buffered voltage at the streaming potentiometer tab reaches the threshold voltage of the SCR. The SCR then becomes conductive and pulls down this node that switches off the switching transistor. This is also the reason we need to power cycle the board because the SCR can only be reset by removing the supply voltage at pin 7 because it stays conductive indefinitely as long as current is flowing through it. The capacitor C7 slows the turning on of the switching transistor somewhat when the supply rails go up, but it does not slow down the switching off when the SCR becomes conductive. The temperature compensation network that was required in the old board for the SCR is not present in the new version. I think that is because these two NPN transistors should have matching temperature characteristics and therefore the threshold of this comparator should not change too much with the temperature while the threshold of the SCR probably moves quite a bit with temperature. A couple of remarks on these circuits. When you are trimming the threshold of this type of comparator by adjusting VR3, consider that VR3 is forming a loaded voltage divider because of the non-negligible current going through this NPN transistor. Therefore, the voltage at this node cannot be considered a stable reference voltage. The way to trim this comparator is therefore not to directly set this voltage to a desired value, but to trim VR3 while observing at which pin 3 voltage the comparator swings and adjusting it accordingly. Another remark is that the JFET buffer only has its remarkably high input impedance in the giga ohms range when the power supply is present. Otherwise, when VREG is down, the JFET buffer just appears like a diode in series with a not too large resistor. When power cycling, we must therefore allow for a significant time until a stable voltage at pin 3 is established. When we are forcing pin 3 voltages through a 20k ohm resistor, for example, we need to allow for at least 100 milliseconds for the pin 3 voltage to stabilize. I now have things set up to measure the discharge curve. Again, we have a setup with just the PCB. The camera body is not connected. But now we are using some features of my test and breakout board that make this kind of measurement setup much easier. First, we are power cycling the circuit board. Using another transistor on the test board, it periodically connects and disconnects pin 4 from ground. This is to simulate triggering of the camera shutter. Because normally, if the camera is cocked, the pin 4 is connected to ground. And when the first curtain starts to run, this connection is broken. So that is what we are simulating with the second transistor that is connected to channel 2 of the function generator. It starts the timing of the circuit. So exactly when the red trace goes down, this is when our timing for the circuit starts and we expect to see the beginning of this approximately logarithmic discharge curve. And we are observing exactly 10 seconds of the discharge and then the function generator shuts things down again. Let me save this to USB. The discharge curve signal is not probed at pin 3, but it is probed at the source of the JFET buffer, so the output of the JFET buffer. We cannot probe 
pin 3 because that would disturb the circuit too much, especially in the long times where tiny, tiny currents are flowing in the discharge network. So only the huge input impedance of the buffer JFET allows us to observe these values without disturbing the operation of the circuit. That's why we needed to characterize the JFET buffer first so we can then translate the values we get here back to what is happening on pin 3, which is the crucial question for us. There is a lot of noise on this signal and it is mostly the noise on the V-charge voltage that couples into the discharge and timing network. Here is our discharge curve over the first second. Let me save that to the USB stick and I will now repeat this process several times so we get progressive zooms into the beginnings of the discharge curve. In order to see an undisturbed discharge curve the comparator must not trigger during this time. We do two things to make sure that it doesn't trigger. First is I set the threshold of the comparator to the highest possible value that the trimming potentiometer allows. And the second is I'm using a coin cell on my test board here to bias pin 3 negatively relative to pin 4. We can check that if I connect the positively to pin 3 and the negative to pin 4 of my multimeter. You can see that pin 3 is at minus 1 volt relative to pin 4. And this makes sure that the voltage coming out of the JFET buffer is always low enough not to trigger the comparator. So we can have an undisturbed discharge curve. The log expansion framework that discharges the timing capacitor is a little marvel of electronical engineering. And it is quite amazing how subtle the behavior of such a handful of components can be. So let's approach it from first principles. As discussed in part 2, what we want to have is that the voltage at pin 4 starts to rise logarithmically with time as soon as the first curtain starts running. Meaning that for each doubling of the exposure time, we want the pin 4 voltage and with it the pin 3 voltage to rise by a fixed increment. Let's say we want the voltage to rise by 135 millivolts per doubling of the time. Expressed mathematically, this means that the voltage at pin 4 as a function of time has the form it is some constant voltage plus 135 millivolts times the base 2 logarithm of the time. Since the positive side of the timing capacitor is at a fixed voltage, this implies that the voltage across capacitor C1 as a function of time must be of the form some constant minus 135 millivolts times the base 2 logarithm of the exposure time. The fundamental law describing the behavior of a capacitor is that the rate of change of the voltage across the capacitor equals minus the current from the capacitor divided by its capacitance. When we plug in the desired form of the voltage across the timing capacitor, we get for the current that it must be some constant divided by the time. The current flowing from the timing capacitor through the discharge diode must be inversely proportional to the elapsed exposure time. Now is that possible at all? But it is clearly impossible for two reasons. The first is that we would need an infinitely high starting current at time zero. And even if the resistance in the discharge network was zero, the diode would only ever conduct a finite current for a finite capacitor voltage. The second reason concerns ever longer exposure times. If this current inversely proportional to the time would indefinitely continue, the total charge moved, which is the area under the current curve, diverges. We would need an infinite amount of charge in the capacitor to begin with in order to keep up a current inversely proportional to 
time indefinitely, at least at the beginning of the exposure and somewhere towards the higher times, the inverse dependence of the current on time will need to be modified for a realistic circuit. Let's define the momentary discharge slope by this expression. Intuitively you can think about it like this. The momentary discharge slope tells us by how much the voltage would increase for a doubling of time if the circuit would continuously behave as it does momentarily. We would like the discharge slope to be constant throughout time, like the red curve. But what we really can achieve looks more like the blue curve. The discharge slope starts from zero and then builds up until it reaches a plateau at about 135 millivolts. And there it stays for several orders of magnitude in time. We see time here on a logarithmical scale. And finally, when we reach times on the order of 10 seconds, the slope drops again and eventually falls to zero. We can understand this qualitative behavior by separating it into three phases. Let's call the first phase the RC dominated phase, because the behavior here is determined mostly by the capacity C and by the resistance R. And even in the case that we have an ideal diode with no regular resistance at all, the finite conductivity of the diode acts like a resistor in conjunction with the capacity to create this RC dominated region. After this comes the diode dominated region. I call it like this because this phase is completely determined by the properties of the diode material. Adding resistance or changing the overall starting voltage will not affect this phase. The diode dominated phase ends when the charge in the capacitor begins to deplete and therefore the capacitor voltage drops towards zero. This causes the discharge slope to fall in this final phase and in the end approach zero when the capacitor is fully discharged. Now where does this seemingly magical number of 135 millivolts per time doubling come from? It really comes down to fundamental physical properties of semiconductor diodes. You can look up the Shockley diode equation in Wikipedia and I won't go through a full derivation of our result, but this diode equation contains a crucial quantity that is called the thermal voltage and that only depends on the temperature. There also is the so-called ideality factor that is about 1.9 for standard diodes like the 1N4148 or the Stabistor diodes used by Asahi Optical. For the standard log expansion network in the electrospotmatic, we are looking at four PN junctions in series. The voltage increase per E-folding of the current works out as the simple product four times the ideality factor times the thermal voltage. And this comes out as 169.5 millivolts. To convert this to a voltage increase per doubling of the current, we need to multiply this by the natural logarithm of 2. The result is 136.2 millivolts or about 135 millivolts. This voltage is ultimately temperature dependent. In fact, it is actually proportional to the absolute temperature, meaning that for each increase of the temperature by 3 degrees Celsius, this value will increase by about 1%. The actual current in the discharge network is proportional to the discharge slope over the time. Here it is compared to the dashed line that is the ideal 1 over t behavior of the current that we would like to have. In the region of very small times at the beginning of the exposure and also in the region of very long exposure times, the actually achievable discharge currents deviate from this ideal behavior. Again, we can qualitatively identify these three phases and it is the diode dominated portion in the middle where the behavior of the circuit is very close to the ideal behavior with the current inversely proportional to time.
But let's take a look at the original discharge networks I found in these circuit boards. The two cameras I looked at have different revisions of the discharge network. I believe that the upper one is the older revision and it is also the one more similar to the patent filed by Asahi Optical. In this version, the current limiting resistor going to V-charge is actually a trimming potentiometer and from the tap of this potentiometer they connected an NTC thermistor. This must have to do something with temperature compensation of the behavior of the circuit. When the NTC gets warmer its resistance reduces and it will pull down this node to a somewhat lower voltage. Overall I don't think that this form of temperature compensation can work very well and it's no wonder that they removed it in what I suspect is the newer version of the board. Both of these board revisions use two of these so-called stabistor diodes in series where each of these diodes has two PN junctions in series internally for a total of four PN junctions in series. The capacitor values differ somewhat between the board revisions. The supposedly newer board revision, the one of the camera we are currently working on, has a fixed resistor as the current limiting resistor to V-charge and instead it uses a trimming resistor in the discharge network in series with the diodes. When calibrating the camera you must be very careful to identify the trimming potentiometers correctly. Between these two revisions the location of the trimming resistor for the discharge network has been swapped around with the other potentiometer that is responsible for the meter calibration. Let's now talk about calibration of the discharge network and the meaning of this new trimming resistor that we see in this revision. The first option we have is varying V-charge. In both port revisions the V-charge voltage regulator has a trimming potentiometer for adjusting the V-charge voltage. Interestingly, changing the V-charge voltage only affects the very beginning of the discharge curves up to about 3 or 4 milliseconds into the exposure. The first few milliseconds of the discharge look very different for different V-charge voltages and it is a bit counterintuitive that the rest of the curve is hardly affected at all by these changes. You can understand it as follows. During the initial RC phase the capacitor is very quickly discharged to a voltage that is a characteristic voltage set by the forward voltage of the diodes. And from this point on in the diode dominated phase the initial voltage does not play a large role. The effect on the discharge slope is seen here and we also see here that only the beginning of the discharge is affected by varying the V-charge voltage. If V-charge is too low the circuit needs too long to build up to the desired discharge slope. However if V-charge is too high we get a bump of a too high discharge slope that can reach to about a hundredth of a second exposure time or a little bit more. The next option and one we only have on the newer board revision is varying the trimming resistor inside the discharge network. This also only affects the beginning of the curve although it has a little bit more reach into the middle regions of the curve than the trimming of V-charge. This is because by increasing the series resistance in the network we can prolong the RC dominated phase and push back the beginning of the diode dominated phase. A high resistance like 10k ohms for example can create a bump of elevated discharge slope with the maximum of the bump at about 5 milliseconds and quite a strong increase of the slope even between a hundredth and a tenth of a second. Smaller resistances have their effects centered in earlier portions of the curve because they do not prolong the RC dominated phase as much. The vertical dotted lines denote the RC time constant of each resistor and capacitor combination. 
These curves show the effect of varying the capacitance of the timing capacitor and it is rather simple because increasing the capacitance simply makes everything slower and shifts the whole curve to longer exposure times. Choosing the capacity is a trade-off. Higher capacity values cause a more even behavior of the circuit at the longer exposure times. However, they also make the circuit slower in building up to the desired discharge slope. The values I have seen in the original board of 150 nanofarad and 300 nanofarad are good compromises between these two ends of the curve. They balance the circuit for a nice behavior between about 1 millisecond and 10 seconds of exposure. Let's compare my mathematical simulations to actual behavior measured with the original circuit board. This is for varying V charge. The voltages I set for taking these scope shots are not the same that I used for the simulation here, but we can at least qualitatively confirm that the effect of the V charge voltage is what we expect from the simulation. Likewise, for varying the resistor trimming in the discharge network, we see qualitative agreement between simulation and measurement. Here are the overall results from measuring the discharge curves of our camera. I combined the four data series taken in the 10 second, 1 second, 0.1 second and 0.01 second window into one plot with a logarithmic time axis. The dashed line is a linear fit to this log linear plot and it shows that the best linear approximation to our results corresponds to 133 millivolts per doubling of time. Although this average slope is very close to what we want to have, the individual parts of the curve are not a good fit as we can see by the much too high discharge slope in the shorter times. In the diode dominated region we see a lower slope of about 120 millivolts per time doubling. By reducing the trimming resistor VR1 it should be possible to get the rest of the curve down to about the same slope and then it should be possible to fit our log compression to this lower slope of 120 millivolts per stop by using a transistor instead of one of the five standard diodes. I simulated this log compression network here and the results look quite good. However, so far the process I used for measuring the discharge curve is very time consuming and inefficient, so I came up with a new one. This new improved test setup does not require any characterization of the Chaffet buffer and it also does not use any signals except those available at the connector. This new setup can very quickly give a direct measurement of the timing produced by the discharge curve over a range of 7 stops. And at the heart of this setup is this lovely box. Let me show you what's inside. It's a prototype of a little floating digital analog converter. The main components are a shift register for creating a step function and an op amp for adding the currents produced by the shift register and for creating a fixed offset voltage. Using this trimmer the step size of the step function can be adjusted and finally this trimmer shifts the step function within the output range of the circuit of minus 1 to plus 2 volts. The whole thing is controlled by this optocoupler. The idea is to connect this to a function generator that produces the square wave that controls the whole measurement setup and power cycles the PCB. So for each power cycle the shift register will step through a loop of eight power cycles. We go through eight different steps of voltage that will be applied between pins 4 and 3 on the PCB. Here we see the new setup on my bench including the Arduino Micro doing the timing. To make this more convenient, all of these parts 
could easily be combined into a single test board. The data from the new measurement setup is analyzed in real time on my PC and here we see the output from the processing script. The script reports the eight timings produced by the eight different voltage levels at pin 3 and it calculates a matrix of calibration errors between all pairs of these timings. In the lower half we see the same data expressed as the measured discharge slope in millivolts per time doubling. Here are the results for the original discharge network captured by the new setup. We again see the pronounced bump of higher discharge slope in the region of a few milliseconds of exposure time. This was captured with the trimming resistor at about 2 kilo ohms. I then turned down the trimming resistor to its minimum at about 0 ohms. The results show that without the trimming resistor, the discharge slope of the original network is much too low in the lower exposure times. It might be possible to dial in just the right resistance value to get a roughly constant discharge slope, but this turned out to be extremely fiddly with the existing trimming potentiometer. Also, the overall low slope of about 120 millivolts would require a more complicated log compression network, as I already showed. I therefore decided to build a new discharge network with more reliable characteristics. My break and test out PCB bundle already contains a few small PCBs that can be used to build up discharge networks that fit very nicely into the existing cutouts on the Pentax Electrospotmatic PCB. Let's build a new discharge network. I have the tiny PCB here, still connected to some of the rest of the panel, which makes for easier handling. We have diodes. We will need four of these. We will use a 330 nanofarad C0G ceramic capacitor. And I actually will use the second one here because I measured that one to have 335 nanofarads, somewhat closer to the nominal value than the first one here. Let's just verify that I got the right one. Yes, 335.7. The first step will be to clean the circuit board and just wipe it with some IPA. Let's apply some flux. Now we will just tin the pads. Let's start tacking on the diodes. I can just barely see the orientation of this diode. And I will change to a smaller soldering tip. I messed up one of the diodes a bit, but hopefully we can fix that later. Fourth diode. Before we reflow this, let me check that I have the diodes in the correct orientation. 
let's try to reflow this thing to make it look a bit more acceptable. First we will put a ton of flux on everything. Let's check if we got the correct electrical connections. Connections all look good. Let's just touch up the solar joints once more. Once more with flux, that is. Looks rather good to me, so let's part it off. That's our final result. I think it looks decent. I know you cannot really see it in good quality on the video unfortunately I'm not set up for recording micro soldering. I lifted the leads of the original components of the discharge network. Here you see the diodes and the capacitor off the board so I can temporarily connect new networks. The one that is here connected is one that I already characterized using a 150 nanofarad capacitor and this is the new one we just built with the 335 nanofarad capacitor. I will now temporarily connect this one with the larger capacitor so that we can characterize it. This trimming resistor, the VR1, is giving me quite a lot of grief. It is currently fully turned down so it is almost a short because in all other positions it just seems to have way too much resistance. Even for the original discharge network. This potentiometer seems to be excessive in its resistance range. All the usable positions are very close to the end here and it is practically impossible to set reasonable values. And for the new discharge networks it is even much more sensitive. They seem to need much lower resistances than the original one. And so I decided to remove this trimming resistor. Probably in the end I will replace it by a fixed resistor which is also one failure point less here because these trimmers are really delicate. Also they have the annoying habit of changing by themselves when you just look at them in a funny way and after you have set such a trimmer the value tends to move around for minutes sometimes until all the mechanical stress is relaxed, I guess. So let's remove it. And there we have it. It is a 6.8K trimmer. Now let's clean it a bit and check on the scope if it would be okay in principle. Let's go. Quarter of the way. Halfway. Three quarters. And maximum. Since the results look so promising, I decided to go with the new discharge network. 
and I removed the old components. Cleaned everything up a little. So let's install the new one. It's designed to be good fit here. And let's try installing a 100 ohm SMD resistor instead of the trimming resistor. It might be just the right size. We are back in testing with the newly installed discharge network and the fixed 100 ohm resistor. The results look excellent. We are very close to 140 millivolts per time doubling for all of the short times. So let me now take a complete data set, including the medium and long times. Results look really, really promising and I'm very happy about how this new discharge network performs also with this fixed resistor here. We can now expect that this board will be a very good match to our new log compression with the new CDS elements. The next step will be to install the new log compression in place of the old one here. The question is how we will be able to install it physically in this very tight space here. But that's what we will deal with in the next video. So see you then. This video is dedicated to my father who is a lifelong Pentax enthusiast. He owns the cameras and he has also provided for the quite significant costs of this project. So thank you dad.